the comments come up, but you won't see who's posting it. Yeah. Okay. All right. And I'm gonna. Yeah. Cool. We're live. Exciting. Hello. Mm -hmm. It's always weird because the people on the replay can hear you from the get go, but you you feel like you're kind of talking to yourself. Yeah. No one is actually watching live. But all right, I'm just gonna refresh the stream. Um, so I can pull this up for myself. All right, we've got a few people joining in. If you are managed to access the, the live, if you found us, then drop a message. Let us know who's here. Um, you can see it looks like we've got quite a few people jumping on. So hey to everyone who is jumping on. I'm just trying to pull up the stream. I haven't actually managed to find it myself. So uh, there we go. All right, expand. Okay. All right. Cool. Awesome. All right. Hey, Aaron. Good to see you here. First comment. Nice work. Let us know if you are watching and let us know where you're from as well. I'm curious. Curious where everyone is from who is watching. Um, I know Rasheen is from, I believe, Northern Ireland. Uh, I know Belfast. It's either Northern Ireland or Ireland. Yeah. There you go. Belfast. Um, Aaron down south in Tunbridge Wells, I think, in Kent. Uh, Steve, I think Steve, Steve's a Birmingham, maybe not. Oh, and from Kent as well. Hello, Tahir, how's it going? Marianne, how's it going? April, hello, April. Hey, Barbara, yeah, Tunbridge Wells, Kent, got it. Um, awesome, Aaron. Hello, all flooding in now. Cool. All right, I'm just loading up the event page quickly so I can. Just make sure people aren't waiting for something to pop up there. Um, and I'm going to drop a link to this in that. But whilst we are, whilst I'm doing that, you can see the special guest here. We could have done like a bit of a reveal, I guess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like the climax. It's a bit of an anti-climax. You just, you just hear. I could have hidden this in this thing. There you go. I can you didn't see? You didn't see? He's, he's not there anymore. All right. We're going to do a big reveal in three, two. What? Here he is. Uh, there we go. There we go. Mr. Hello, guys. Gavin, Mr. Gavin Sweeney, for those who don't know. And yeah, I think Gavin's got a pretty impressive story. So, Gavin, do you want to quickly sort of just summarize, sort of, I guess, well, how, one, how did you find Amazon? And then when you did find Amazon, or what was the, what's the sort of journey from, from then to now? Yeah, so I mean, I, I find Amazon on Twitter, really. I'm, I'm pretty active on Twitter, seeing a bunch of people were just killing it on Twitter. And that, that's essentially how I got into it. I know a lot of US people doing it, but not a lot of like UK people. So I joined tons and tons of Facebook groups. I networked from the start, really. But yeah, I didn't start with a lot of money. I only started with like 1,500 to 2,000 pounds. And I, I just hit it hard from the start, like, I, I would even put it into words, like, I, I would wake up at 6am, I'd head out at 7am, I'd get back at 6pm from retail arbitrage, then I'd head back out again until 10pm, so there was quite a few long nights to, there. Fast forward now, six, seven, well, what's it now, like nine months, I've got well over £60,000 of profit, I now have four VAs, I'm looking for my fifth VA, doing it full time, also expanded to America now, so it's like things have moved pretty fast, which is fantastic. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, I think I, I was sort of half listening, half liking the comments, checking who's who's here. So apologies, yeah. but um, yeah, I, I, know, I don't know if you mentioned it, but you obviously quit your job pretty recently. Did you? I think you left. Was it like three weeks ago now? Left the left your job. What what was it that you were doing? Yeah, it was two weeks ago. So I was a, what's called a CRM consultant, which is customer relationship management. What we would do is sort of manage the, we build systems to manage data for IT companies, uh, governments. So an example would be for university students, we would track the entire life cycle of a student from them going from college to entering the university, predicting their grades, all their contact management, any sort of marketing involved. So very like, IT consultation type work, which was fun, but it wasn't really, I wouldn't say it was fulfilling. It's definitely not as exciting as Amazon. Cool, cool. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I think Amazon is 
pretty exciting and it sounds like you've I mean to get where you are it's pretty pretty quick and I think from what I understand at least the sort of secret to your success you want to put it that way has probably been the sort of maybe slightly different well I think quite different sourcing method that you've used and yeah we'll go into that sort of in a bit more detail throughout the the live but I think as you sort of highlighted there it's it does take hard work right and I mean you've gone to where you are but I mean whilst sort of having a full-time job and I know now you've sort of get rid of that but do you have a lot of I think my question for you is do you have like a lot of time now because you've gone from full-time job to working sort of without any VAs or I think you had one maybe to now Mm -hmm. you've quit your job and you said your team's expanding to five VAs so what does a sort of day-to-day look like for you so this is what confuses me actually what I'm trying to work out now is like how do I optimize my time because do I have more time yeah I have so much more time to do things but it's like the efficiency kind of drops a little bit because before this urgency I've set a amount of time frames to do all my work and to make these moves but now I'm doing more work overall but it's not as efficient in terms of my day-to-day time I'll tell you what it is after my VA's finish, finish training so I wake up around 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. Standard stuff, breakfast, gym. Then each of my VAs is going to get a one-hour session with me every every day. So that's that's four hours there, right there. Then and that'll that'll just be running through their deals, giving them training, going through sourcing techniques and how they can improve. After that, I'll source myself in the USA. I'll do some sourcing in the UK as well. Look at more hot flips. I'm hiring for the U. I'm hi- I'm hiring one more as well, so that's going to be a lot more training. So yeah, my my days, my day is going to be quite filled with a lot of calls with training. So as I begin to outsource and delegate my tasks, one thing that I have started doing, which is super useful, is I look at where my time goes and I write this down on an Excel sheet and I write down how much it would cost me if I was to outsource that to somebody else. If, I, if I've done like six hours work and someone else can do that for like five quid an hour, then obviously that's a task to go. So it's, it's been observed of me on time while trying to stay efficient on what I'm doing. No, cool. Yeah. And I think it's, it sounds like you're doing a lot there to sort of scale, which I think is the, the key. Like it's not, it's almost not like you're in the business, almost like you're growing the business. Um, Mr. McCaffrey, are you are you selling in the US? Not as yet. Um, me and Lloyd had a bet on about who would get there first. Um, so far, it's still up for grabs. Um, I actually talk, spoke to Thomas Parkinson about it a few months ago. And he says, lad, if you're not doing well over a million quid a year in the UK, he says, why devolve your energies into another market? He says, you're still just leaving meeting the table in one. So I have... I'm very different from Gavin. I went a lot of wholesale at the moment and it's working well for me, but I'm still padding that out. So yeah, the goal is to go Germany and then to America, probably in that order. But it'll probably be maybe this time next year before I'm there. Why Germany over U- over US though? That'd be my question. Um because I think it would still probably send UK stock that had been selling well pre Brexit mm-hmm. direct to Germany rather than source solely from America into America. But I did bring on a VA last week who had been drop shipping in America previously. Yeah. So I'm going to tie with the notion of just letting her just stick at that. She do it. It's a complete passive line and just let her edit me of zero involvement. But okay. that's very early days. So I don't know on that one. Um, I think it's still too hands on. Yeah, I think from my experience so far is that America, the return investment per item is just so much higher. You're spending yeah. more per item as well, and the profit is a lot higher. I've done like two hours of sourcing this morning in America. I spent 400 USD with an average ROI of 80%, nice. which, is like, which is like insane. Did you go down the route of setting up an uh, LLP? Is it LLP, isn't it? I think it's an LLC. 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 Yeah. So um, I've used an LLT. 
wait i've used a limited company for now but in the future i'm going to transfer that to an llc the, yeah. the idea is that i sort of think everything is momentum based you get momentum once the ball is rolling then you start out the more complex stuff yeah. that's that's sort of how i approach this same way as i approach the uk amazon get the ball rolling and then sort out complexities after as they start to come was there much I'm assuming with the America stuff you're using a prep center over there, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. it's completely hands off. Was there much, you know, technical side to like getting set up within the estates? It was a lot easier than I thought, man. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah, because we don't we don't pay VAT either. So yeah. all, all you do is get your products put into like a tax sales tax free state like Delaware, and yeah. then you don't pay any sales tax. Apart from that, you just create a separate company. Keep keep your address details separate because you don't want the same address details as your UK company. So just keep everything separate as an extra layer of protection. And then, yeah, man, you sign up in America. It's super quick and it's super easy. Cool. I'm assuming you still use a UK address over here rather than uh, yeah. physical. No. And um, did you set up an American bank account or anything like that? Am I overthinking Nothing. Always? I just use TransferWise. So I use TransferWise, and then uh -huh. I got my I got my VA to go through every single uh, website on tactical arbitrages newsletter list, and it checks every single one and sees which one accepts international cards. If they do, then I just source from their websites for now. So I've got a list of sites that we can all source from. That's really yeah, I, think that's, I think that's the one issue we've sort of seen as well. Like my dad sort of manages the US side of things and we're doing the same routes a limited company in the UK. And that's the one issue you're gonna have is source cancelling orders because they don't accept the international cards. So it's almost like a bit of a bit of a game there. But as you mentioned, you can sort of filter that to find those stores that do accept them. And yeah, I'm curious if you if you guys watching if uh, I'm curious who is sourcing in the US, who's oh, selling in the US, Amazon US, who's selling Amazon UK and if you sell in any other let me know i'm very curious to see i think the majority is going to be amazon uk but let us know in the comments Kevin, what were you going to say sorry Evan? yeah i don't want to teach an old dog how to suck eggs but surely a uh, just using an amex credit card bypasses that issue i think you'd run i'm not sure on the conversion rates i think the issue there will be conversion rates so you might pay a fee with, with a transfer wise card though all I do is convert the GBP to a USD and I just use that to pay and there's no extra charge. Yeah. Um, I was actually speaking to a guy the other day and he were talking about, you know, cashback. And I was like, you know, capital on taps 1%, Amex is 1%. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember, he said there was one, was it United or something? It was an American card. And he's like, yeah, we get 5%. <laughs> yeah, it's different. I was thinking going, what I could do with 5% cashback on every purchase, I'd be like, I'd buy a new car. Mate, like, it's insane. 5% cashback, that's just not heard of over here. Like, I'm like, you don't know you're living. That's just yeah. amazing. But with Amex, though, what I like about them is their offers. They have offers where you get like 10 to 15% off websites. So if you're just going to mm -hmm. snap a purchase through, you get cash back. And you know, yeah. I'm not sure how that works with VAT, but I don't think you can get VAT on that. So it's 10 to 15%, but it's probably more than 10 to 15% when you think about it. Exactly that, yeah. Yeah. I think someone nice. just asked me if I do RA or OA. So I used RA when I had very little capital. When I had like less than 5,000 pounds, I was purely RA, typically because the competition is mostly less. And like you, you generally get higher ROI on your items. So I was doing clearance items until I got over 5k capital. Then I transitioned to solely to OA. I think you have to be careful though if you're going to do one or the other. Because I remember the first consultation call I had with, well, the only, well, yeah, I remember the consultation call that I had with Luke way back at the start. And we had a discussion around RA and OA. And if, if, you, if you keep on doing both, then you're going to split your learning in half. Because you're doing, you're, doing, you're doing a lot. So I fully transitioned to AWARE after my capital went over 5K. And yeah, it's gone great since. I think the thing I sort of mentioned there with RA is it's 
I think with RA, it's kind of the more you do it, the, the easier it is in a way because you start to pick up on trends in stores and mm -hmm. you start to build out roots and patterns and it's that economies of scale type things you're going to be prepping yourself. So, yeah, it's almost like I remember that I haven't done RA in probably a couple of years now, um, close to. And but I remember like Tesco, you kind of used to get an idea, for example, of which items you're looking for. You can get into, I guess, you don't want to stop looking for new things but you could definitely be quicker in, in stores so in different stores so i think that's what it's kind of getting at and then having those Ooh. systems in place and the sort of scale there so but yeah i think it's just ra is great when you got because you really if you've got limited capital you want to make the most of that capital you get better returns um but when you do have that more capital available uh OA is there but yeah there's there's pros and cons of of each um but yeah, I think to summarize the answer there would be it's all online arbitrage now. Is that right? Do you do any wholesale? I don't. So I was speaking to wholesalers in Italy to try and get some products, but it turned to be a lot more challenging than I thought. I, I, I like to go deep on products. So wholesale does sound pretty ideal, but at the moment, a lot of my products come straight from Amazon. Like I, I watch Amazon when they restock and look at the low price points. And then if they stop like 100 and that's all they've got, they'll just buy them online. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I think if you, if you can you can get 100 or something, then it's happy days. Um, <laughs> although it depends, I guess. Like if, I think when you're buying bulk for online arbitrage, you kind of got to be careful. It's like, if you can see a good deal and there's 100 left and you can buy that last 100, as you said, it's happy days. But if you're on the Smiggle site and you can buy 100, it's probably not a, <laughs> not a good, yeah. not a good sign. So, the point I'm making there for anyone um, listening is that you're looking at the sort of, this is the thing where like a lot of people complain about price tanking and that, and you're not always going to avoid it, but you can often forecast. And what I mean by that, if you take the site Smiggle, for example, they pretty much supply what seems like an infinite amount of stock and they'd have no issues with resellers. So it's very easy to go and buy from them, but just because something is easy doesn't mean it's it's good. Like, for example, with Source Mobile, if you go and put on a barcode match sourcing, it's probably not a good way to go about it. If you Google a wholesaler and go with the first option, probably not a good way to go about it. Whereas if you can find a deal that's harder to find and say, for example, they have limited stock available and you can snap up that stock quickly when it comes back into stock or whatever, then that's going to probably be a lot more profitable. So there is a big difference there. And that's one of the many things that can affect sort of for example, price tanking and being able to forecast those things. And it's like not buying, for example, from a lot of stores when they're full price, but buying them on discounts. But what Gavin's saying, I think as you'll go on to kind of lead on to your strategy, a lot of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of your strategy, Gavin, is kind of that time sensitive, being able to react quickly and snack up, snap up that stock when it becomes available. Yeah, so absolutely. And that's, that's why the sales velocity and reading paper is so important because if, if you look at keeper you can understand what amazon's lead times are and you can cross-reference with what amazon's saying with what the wider market is saying and if there's an overall stock shortage then you can put your keeper trackers on amazon and snap them up quick but if, if you if you want like a hundred of a unit you're, you're expecting to sell them all within like one or two weeks so you're looking at the very top sales ranks for this for this type of moves you're not looking at like one percent items you're looking at like 0 0.1 percent items and, and better so i think it's from your kind of point of view and look just to just to kind of mention here we're gonna i know we're talking quite a lot of high level stuff so um if not everything is making complete sense we are going to kind of talk about this a, a fair bit but then at the end of this session as well we're going to give people an opportunity if they want to to go deeper on sort of gavin's sourcing methods there the opportunity to do that so we will go into that opportunity at the end where you get some more information um to go deeper on it but we will kind of throughout this touch on different elements there but i think as you kind of said interesting point which i want to dive deeper on you're kind of just saying that you're not just looking at the Amazon market in isolation, but you're kind of saying a general stock sh shortage across the economy, right? So um, for example, like in the UK right now, I guess, well, are you happy to share what an example of that would be? I mean, you kind of look at it seasonal, I guess people can can guess. You have yeah, to share. Sure. 
Um, I, 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 two words, and I'm going to say this because, yeah, I need a card to go and collect it, and this is pretty much our air right now. La Hacienda, like this brand, like fire pits and like what? Pa not patio heaters, but yeah, like fire pits and stuff like that. Like very outdoor stuff. They're like whoever whoever can go and collect them from our air shops right now is going to be absolutely killing it. And that that seasonal items in December would not sell as well. But as it's summer now, they're, they're just absolutely killing it. If people are sourcing them, they'll be making so much money. Plus, on those particular items as well, it doesn't even have to be FBA. Like, they're large, bulky items. If you can go mm -hmm. clear them out of Lidl's, Tesco's, Asda, store them, and stick them on Facebook Marketplace and sell them locally, you'll flip them without having to ever prep them or pack them. And then, well, your accountancy is up to yourself. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good point, actually, because when it, when it comes to like hot trending products, especially like these, you have to understand if it's better to FBA them or FBM them. Yeah, because you you want your cycle time to be as quick as possible. If your if your lead time into Amazon from home is like one week, you could have already sold like a hundred in that time. So <laughs> sometimes actually it's better just to suck up the pain and just FBM every single one, which is a lot of effort, but it's what's got to be done. Yeah, but like, even if you can sell them locally, if you can sell them locally without having to even ship them at all, mm -hmm. it's a lot better if you have like 10 of them sitting in the yeah. garage and people can come collect them. I know that doesn't work for everybody, but there will be certain items that those opportunities are there. And it's sometimes people get so focused on just the one method, they don't even think outside the box for other methods. I think this is the thing, right? It's, it's exactly as you said, people in business in general uh, and in life in general, I think you kind of get. And it's, it's, there's a lot of benefit to this, but almost that like getting head down sort of in the trenches and not kind of seeing the bigger picture. And whilst it's good to have that sort of tunnel vision focus in a lot of areas, that consistency and that dedication, it's when you can kind of take a step back and do that small thing that's going to have a huge impact on the business. And like a lot of the coaching stuff I do with people is trying to identify these areas. So someone I'm working with where it's like so much just nitty gritty detail but there's one small tweak that can have like a, a massive difference so i think mm. this is one of those kind of this sort of method i say method but it's very general because it's because there's a lot of different things there's not like one right or wrong way but in general it is that kind of thing you're identifying maybe those products that are a bit more um not bog standard from what i can understand and i mean I, i've seen some of the uh, items that gavin has done this for and they yeah um have been pretty pretty insane so is that is that kind of like a fair summary it's a bit more trying to focus on i guess the a few fewer items but yeah it's true quality items yeah and that's a good point yeah it's focusing on better quality items these items are typically more expensive but people are always wondering like what about returns for these expensive items but typically the more expensive the better the quality the less returns you get so i think i think you sort of have to see it for yourself and not just think it's expensive if i, if I get a return it'll hurt me a lot because typically you're not going to get that many returns and if you have like a 90 percent roi then you, you can even accept a 20 percent return rate and still be like immensely profitable yeah and i think this is the thing as well as like a lot of people again going back to that the more resistance there is to something like the more barriers there are often the more lucrative it is it's like things like something that's potentially oversized talks about there or something that maybe you have to fbm when you're kind of going a bit outside the norm to test these things and to try these different things like sending in oversized items like what's wrong with that and as you mentioned there's something that's a bit more expensive like what's wrong with selling those items actually questioning those things there i think is yeah important and it um yeah it's really interesting and i mean look we've got a we've got a few questions in the comments i think the one thing i will say with regards to the us we will have like a, a dedicated sort of live to this at some point in the near future maybe get gavin back on um, i know thomas is interested in the us and so maybe try and get him on as well so we're not going to go too deep into the us here but there are a few quick questions there so i mean the first one uh, i think first of all hey to everyone else who has joined in if you have jumped on and you haven't already said let us know um where you are tuning in from i know we've got someone from india which i think is the furthest so far pretty cool um 
But yeah, Asif says he'd like to do US, but how do you go about paying yourself? Now, I'm not too sure what you mean exactly here, Asif, but I assume you mean your US balance. Uh, and if that's the case as well, similar to what it used to be like with EFN, you just need to set up um, a bank account to send those Amazon funds to uh, and use a US bank account so you can use your TransferWise details there so that you're going US dollars, receiving US dollars into your TransferWise account and not getting ripped off by Amazon's exchange rate. If I've misunderstood the question, let me know. But I think that is it. If you're talking about paying yourself from sort of a like payroll point of view, well, there's lots of different options there. And really, you need to, it's a very much a unique situation in terms of what's most tax efficient for you. Um, so I don't think we're necessarily the best suited to answer that question. I don't know if you guys have got anything to add there, but uh, I think it will be simpler though. In general, if you're not paying VAT, it should be simpler because you're not what, what do you mean? you're not filing any VAT returns to, before you pay yourself or to pay yourself. It's just money in, money out. So it's, yeah, it's that, that's why I'm not. That's why I'm not too sure what he means in terms of what you mean by paying yourself. But when I say sort of tax elements, I don't necessarily mean like VAT. I mean, for example, mm -hmm. there's difference between payroll and dividends, and then there's things like well, you can go and put things into ICES and you can go and do different things with your money. This is something I'm looking at. There's lots of different options there. So when you say pay yourself, well, one person who's got a full-time job and if they pay themselves more, it's going to put them into another tax bracket, might be better off, I don't know, building up funds or someone as a sole trader. Or if you've got one company and you're already hitting that payroll threshold, maybe you're better doing dividends. That's the kind of thing I mean from the tax point of view, uh, tax efficient point of view there, if that makes sense. Um, Xavier says, and he's referring to, I think when we're talking about the cards before, he said maybe get an Amex dollar card to save conversion of around 2.6%. I'm not familiar with that. Um, I don't know if you guys are, but yeah, cheers for the suggestion there. I'm going to write that down. Uh, thank you. Amex dollar card. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I need to note that as well. Let's have a look into. Um, Manish again. We're going to go into US in detail in the future. We sort of mentioned this already in terms of how to get around the stores that don't take UK cards. I mean, from my point of view, we're trying to play around with getting ways to be accepted for payments. But as Gavin sort of said, that you can go and look at the ones that take the international cards there. Um, myself and Gavin are both just set up as a UK and as a company. We're not um, an LLC, so you are going to run into that issue. I don't know the stores off by hand because my dad manages the business, but I don't know with Home Depot, for example, Gavin, if you're able to purchase there or not. Oh, I'm not sure. Let me have a quick look. Cool. All right. Um, yeah, Manish, again, in terms of you can kind of use the TransferWise card there. It doesn't uh, It's not necessarily a US card because you're going to have difficulty getting a US card. Um, you can look at using like PayPal, for example, as well. Different elements there. Um, uh, Asif says in regards to payroll. Yeah, I mean, Asif, it depends. I, I would speak to an accountant there really to figure out what's, and maybe a financial advisor, trying to figure out what's best for your situation. So it really does, really does depend there. Um, Robert says, how do you guys avoid IP issues with brands protecting themselves on Amazon? I don't. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, Eamon just if he gets if he gets an IP issue, he looks at the address on the letter received and he sends them a, sends them a nice surprise in the mail. I uh, I actually got one today. I tell you what, I'll do you the deal. I got one today from a was it Carbon Clean? It's a very fast selling item that I see. There's about another fifteen FBA sellers. They're all sourcing it from Boots. And I would recommend anybody that's selling the black carbon soap that they're sourcing from Boots run for the hills because, yeah, I checked them out. They are direct to customer and they talk no nonsense. Straight email today, go, on, go away. So, yeah, 10 minutes today, went, checked the due diligence, went, oops, sent them a message, apologized, delayed and closed the listen, and asked them if they very kindly retract the IP claim. Haven't heard anything back. They probably won't even retract it, but that's the only way around it, really. Um, pay more attention the next time you're sourcing. But 
it happens sometimes you can be selling something for six months and then suddenly there's an IP issue. Um, close the listen, pull all stock from that and that brand and try and mitigate the consequences. It is going to happen. It's part of the arbitrage model. You will get IP mm -hmm. issues. So, yeah, I think uh, I think the difficult thing with, with these lives um, is that it's hard to go deep into tactics because people are at different points. And if we go too much into one thing that's high level or, or low level, you put people off. So I think what I will say for this in terms of IP issues is that there's, there's prevention is better than the cure. So I'd say it's, you're trying to do things like your account health daily checks and making sure you're going to sell a center. I'd say twice a day, because if you check at 9 a.m. and then 5 p.m. the next day, you're looking outside that 24 hour window. So making sure you're doing all your account health checks. But in terms of prevention, well, you want to be looking at things like um, basically all your checks, like is the seller same as the brand? How many different sellers are there? What's the seller count over time? Um, looking at sort of IP radars of different tools and you're doing due diligence. What it really comes down to there, I talked about this last night in the Amazon Arbitrage Blueprint sort of training program, the weekly live we do. I talked about this and I sort of said, well, it really just comes down to risk and reward. There's always an IP issue. Eamon mentioned this last night with the brand The Ordinary, um, sold it for a hell of a long time, lots and lots of units and out of the blue, just sort of IP issues um, there. Another brand, Harry's from Boots. These kind of things will happen. And look, Robert, I think what I will say is hopefully those few pointers there have helped, but during lives like this we can't really go into tactics too, too much detail because there's some, some things that's like bog standard for people but what i would say because this is one thing i learned from actually from natalie chromie is if you do get something do a removal order as well um i don't know if it makes too much of a difference so basically if you got an ip alert for a brand xyz i'd go in straight away into your inventory delete and create a removal order for that product i would then search in your inventory to see if you have any more items from the same brand and if you do, I would delete and create removal orders for those products. Um, yeah, I mean, even if you get like an email or whatever, before you even try and prove the authenticity of that email, I'd still just delete and create a removal order. You can always cancel the removal order later down the line. Um, last thing I'll say here before I pass it over to the other guys to see if they've got anything else to add is that, look, if you want more help with this, we do offer free strategy calls. It'll be either Eamon, Lloyd, or myself on those. And on those calls, we go through any sort of questions you have. We help you to put together a plan to either start or scale your arbitrage business. And then at the end, if it's right for you, we'll talk about the training program that we do have, but there's no obligation on that. So Gavin's already mentioned this. He had one of these calls when it was slightly different. It was very early down the line. And I think Gavin, you got benefit from it from what I've heard. So mm -hmm yeah check the i'll put a drop a link in the comments there if that is of interest but i'd say yes if you do want more detail on that feel free to jump in on one of those calls um do either of you have anything to add there like high level on ip that i've i've missed so i personally say like i've never had an ip claim yet but i've sold a lot of items where it's like ip flagged on many apps but if the sales velocity is good i'll just sell it anyway but one thing I will say is that if I see the offer count at some point in history go from like 20 to 10, like immediately on a straight down line, I, I would never touch that listing. Because that listing is like a death sentence. You, you, you get on that listing, you're probably going to get an IP claim. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a big flag um, for sure. That's why I missed. So yeah, thanks, Kevin. Yeah, I can't really add anything to that. Seller count suddenly dropping off. Or as I said, it was chatting to look last night. If you see an item that's selling and there is maybe five or six sellers selling consistently, and every time it rises by one, it's instantly dropped back down to the same five or six level number. It's probably because the other people have license in our agreements or permission to sell it. And every time a new person comes on, they're very swiftly dealt with. So that's another telltale sign again. Keeper, you need to pay it version of Keeper to really be able to identify that. Um, not a plug for Keeper at all, but if you're going to be serious about OA, you definitely need that too. Just because without that, you miss it, and any other extension plugins, if you don't have the paid version, you're going to miss it. So, yeah, that's cool. Yeah. Awesome.
Apologies, I got a bit distracted there. Um, for those who don't know, just got a puppy and I can hear him <laughs> complaining outside the door. Um, but yeah, he's he's gone from being very, very sort of dopey and sleepy to now just being a Duracell bunny. Uh, I think you're right, Eamon. Eamon mentioned he thinks he was drugged at the time of purchase, and I think that <laughs> I think that could be the could be the case. To be honest, he's, oh, yeah, yeah, he's just absolute nuts now, and he doesn't like being left alone alone whatsoever even for a minute. So, oh, yeah. with about fifty people on the live, I could argue at least half a dozen of them are going to want to see this puppy. Why don't you go get him and introduce him? All right, I'll go. I'll go grab the puppy, <laughs> and you guys. You guys can look at the comments there from uh, underneath Robert's comments. I think Ash is next, and I'll go. I'll go try and get this little little man. My uh, my comments aren't showing up too well, even on the actual Facebook group. So, Gavin, I'm gonna have to let you read them. Yeah, Sam. So, what? Who was the last comment? He said um, Robert, but I can't even see that. The last one I can see is. Abu asking about the prep center and that's directly yeah, and Ash. Would you guys like to re ask your questions, please? And we'll just get straight back to it. Yeah. Um, so Tammy has asked, how do you get consistent with OA and RA goods uh, may not be repeatedly available or an offer? And it takes time to build that up, Tommy. Um, you're going to find leads that are maybe going to be available this week in Tesco's. Next week, they're gone. You just need a greater number of ASINs to sell so that when something's out of stock or no longer an offer, you've got all the items there that you can fall back on. I'd say at the minute I've got approximately 500 live ASINs. I'd say I have 3,500 inactive ASINs that were either one-off items that I bought or I starting out or items that are no longer profitable. Um, part and parcel of the business model, you adapt, you move on, you find items that are profitable. The ones that are replenishable with good margins, your gems, order them in bulk and build out from there. That's so many items, man. Wow. So yeah, add- I, I noticed that. But <laughs> again, that's not even a fair picture because I, was, I sat the other night for half an hour and I scrolled through old ASINs from like the very start. Mm-hmm. And I seen there was like a hundred in a row that were all ink cartridges because Back two years ago, I literally bought the entire contents of a stationery shop and I was listing fight. I made good money off that. It was crazy time. I was yeah. still working full time doing night shifts. I get into the car at 9 a.m., drove 200 mile, bought the entire contents of a shop, came back, slept in the car for half an hour and went back and did another night shift. But it wasn't the hardest night shift in the world, and I was sleeping most of the time, and the rest of the time I was sourcing. But yeah, that's how I started. It was a lot of hustle. Mate, that's the perfect that is, that is a cute puppy. <laughs> <laughs> he's relaxed when he's cuddling. If I put him down, he'd just be running around everywhere and complaining. So we'll see how long he wants to be held for. Um, but yes, still not certain on the name. So if anyone has any name ideas, feel free to drop those in the comments. And I think, um, I don't know if I can commit to this, but I'm going to say that the the comment with the most reactions, <laughs> I will, I'll go with, I'll go with the name. But, um, yeah. Poppy McPopface. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Done. So we'll, we'll see. Maybe he's going to get named tonight. Um, it's going to have to pass the mum test because I did come up with a name, which I'm not going to say live. And my mum kind of banned that. So, um <laughs> you've been reconsidering reconsidering from there but i think you guys are saying you have difficulty seeing the comments so ash's comment was that he's been selling 99 pound 500 pound 600 pound two grand items all day long it feels the competition at those levels that other sellers are very different to those products below 50 pounds and uh, shoebox size amazon have also introduced uh, the heavy and bulky program which I was an early adopter here in the UK and the shipment costs are very competitive. So yeah, I'm not actually familiar with heavy and bulky. I don't know if it's a prep center use. I don't know if it's similar to small and, and light there. It's, Maybe my team though, I leave a lot down to my team now. So I need to actually probably check that with them. And um, thank you for uh, mentioning. It's a counterpart to the small and light. It was only produced there about six weeks, two months ago. And it's, I'm not exactly sure in the dimensions, but I think it's items that are over, 15 kilos i'd need to get the actual criteria but but it's they will do fulfillment up to pallet size 
and apparently the shipment's quite reasonable on it. Yeah. But definitely agree with what I've said. Like when it comes to these high ticket items, it's more experienced sellers on them more often than not. So there's there's yeah, far less right. like nuking the listing. People don't nick the listing as much. They're more like because I never really use the repricer on my super hot items. Like there was never an issue with that. But when I'm dealing with like yeah, as he said, items less than fifty quid, everybody's just absolutely savage on them. It's like they just get nuked to oblivion. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I find that especially when you go to some wholesale items that are harder to get, the more experienced sellers is if there are two types, there's the ones that are going to bully into oblivion, mm-hmm. or these are ones that just play for all day long because they know the game and yeah. they'll just match. Whereas items that are more easily available, RA and OA, you get people that are nervous. You get people that want their money back. They have different priorities. They have different overheads, and they behave in a different manner. Like VAT registration really puts manners in some people because they realize actually, I can't just tank the list and make money on this anymore. Yeah, I remember when I was getting VAT registered. What the ROI for a lot of my items was like one hundred and seventy percent. It's like. Okay, VAT's going to take so much of this. So I just nuked the price a little bit and got to the buy box and sold way more. Like, there is some very logical reasons to nuke the price, though. But if it, it does feel like a lot of it isn't necessary. But yeah, I don't know their circumstances. So that's kind of an assumption. Yeah. Um, I'd have to agree with that. Yeah. What do you reckon, look? Yeah, I mean, I was a bit distracted there, but in terms of, I think higher price items for me, for me, it's for me, it's almost the case of, I just kind of think of well, it's almost like why, why not? Like with the higher price items, I think as Gavin said, some people are scared of refunds. And look, if you've only got a grand or two grand capital and you're buying something for five hundred quid, okay, yes, probably not the best idea. But in general, I, I haven't seen it to be an issue. I will say, for example, like with um, tech products to be careful because some high priced tech products can be a bit tricky in terms of making sure they are the same and looking for little things. Like I remember one time I bought um, a DVD player and one is like a global version and one's like EU only and you can't play I don't know, global movies on the EU one or something like that. I didn't even know that that was a thing, but apparently it is. Um, yeah, so look out for those kind of things, uh, different sort of like process and stuff, make sure they're exactly the same. I'm not very techy, so I, maybe for other people it is easier to notice. But yeah, I mean, even when I was trying to buy like extra RAM for my desktop, I struggled to identify what I actually needed. And a lot of these things look very similar. So when you're trying to make sure the same, that's the one thing I'd say. But in general, I would say, look, go for it, especially as other people have said there, because as the trends I've mentioned, if less people are doing it, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing. It's just because there's barriers there. So it's like if you go and type in an Argos barcode, which is basically what Source Mogul's doing and matching it to an Amazon listing, anyone can do that. But if you're actually going into Argos and then they give you the wrong item, which Argos are very good at doing, and you don't just go, oh, I'm going to return this, but then you actually look and you see, actually, this is a bit of a gem on Amazon because people aren't managing to find it because it's not what's being advertised. And you go and sell that, which I've done in the past with these little teddies, different assortment, and made a lot of money from it. So it's just those extra little things in in a lot of the business that make the difference, I would say, and especially they're important. Like I always say this, I'm using a prep center, I'm BAT registered, I've got a bunch of VAs. So how can I compete with someone who's just getting started prepping themselves, doesn't value their time. Um, so they're not really factoring that in. And then also not BAT registered, um, doesn't have overheads like VAs. How can I compete against them? Well, it's my experience really, that, that's what it is. It's that ability to know not to buy a smiggle item at full price as an example that's one example but it's a lot a lot of things there so and it's knowing that plane will be all run a 15 25 percent off sale pretty pretty often and then doubling down on those it's all those different things that that add up and i think that's where as a coach going back to that is where i try and add value is i've i've walked the walk so 
where people can get value is from leveraging the experience. And that's what I try and do now in my other businesses. I want to leverage the experience of other people. Yes, you've still got to go and do it. You can't like get this silver bill that's going to save everything for you, save the work, but you can reduce the time and the, the energy and the negative impacts of all those things. So going back to the question, yeah, it's those barriers. And if you're not put off by them and you can do those extra little steps, that's where you really make the money. And I think that's what a lot of Gavin's strategy revolves around is it's doing those things that are a bit less common and identifying those trends and doubling down on them and you make those decisions there. So yeah, um, now I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, which I often do, but hopefully that will make sense. But there, there's some absolutely ludicrous items that you can buy for Amazon. Like, what did I buy? I was selling some telescopes. I don't know how I came across it. I was selling like telescopes for like 200 plus quid. Like, the, the, there's so many different avenues to Amazon that we just don't know of, or we don't even see, and it's just, it's just insane. Like, you could go on an Amazon, type in anything, and then look at the best sellers for that rank, and then just go through those, have a look at Keeper, and see if you can manually source them from different websites. Like, you don't need to get bogged down to one standard way of doing Amazon. There's a million different methods. Yeah, um, it, there is. Yeah. That's the thing, that's the thing. Like, I can still remember the first thing I bought wholesale was wedding planners. And I was buying ones at a Poundland at a quid. And I was listing them on Amazon, and I'd only just started out. I'd seen the listing, and then I'd seen the really nice ones that were ranked number one in that category. And it's like, they're the ones I want to sell. Mm -hmm. And I just went and sourced them, and it wasn't all that hard. Now, there's no margin in them anymore, but it was a great sort of insight into going, okay, just because you find one thing at a profit doesn't mean that the other things aren't profitable. And it's, yes, it's very simple reverse searching, but again, people, you just you go with one thing that's working you just get tunnel vision on it and the big picture loses away from you where sometimes you just need somebody to go hey why are you not doing the complete opposite of this which can completely just skew the profits very quickly all of a sudden mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how did tell us work out for you in the end you still selling them how the what the telescopes oh yeah sorry <laughs> i've got a few <laughs> but I only, I only bought a few. Like, a lot of my items are high velocity sales items, but I also have a strategy where I can identify items where Amazon is usually out of stock, but something like restocks like once a month or once or twice a month, where I can just hop in, sneak a few sales in, for like 50 to 150% ROI, and then get back out again. Nice. So there's, it's, it's, it's quite varied. You have the high velocity items, but you can do A to A on lesser velocity from A to A, as long as the offer count is still low. But again, that's that's because there's a market-wide shortage. So it's, it's identifying that as well, cross-referencing that with Google and seeing, ensuring that everywhere else is out of stock. Yeah. yeah. Like cool. a perfect example of this time last year, your hand sanitizer, your, your gloves, masks, like it was just crazy the shifts and moves that were going on there um and that's the sort of thing by the time people are talking about it on facebook it's too late so that's what that's, people need to pay attention yeah that, that's that's a good point you've always got to be the trend starter not joining at the end of the trend because when a trend starts to end it's typically pretty savage to those who are right to it and go deep whereas if you, if you enter the trend at the start, you can identify when it's going to end and when you need to exit your position. So I'll, I'll always be on the lookout for new trends and don't be the last one to join. No, last in, first out. Yeah, you can burn off them. Yeah. All right, well, I'm conscious, there, I'm conscious there are a few more sort of questions and then I want to I want to jump back to a bit more about sort of Gavin's story, a bit more about what he, he does. That is, I guess, unique. Cause that's I think where people get the value. If you do get it, things can be a bit repetitive, but um, I'm just trying to see where I was at now. Okay, yeah, Callan, Callan said, so in terms of US, uh, he says the prep center in US, they can buy the stock for you. They have 5% commission. That's really interesting. If you'd be happy to share that, I'd love to look into them there, uh, there Callan. 
um, they'll be really cool, especially if they're in a sales, um, sales tax free stakes is kind of essential for me right now, but even, yeah, I'm sure they must be if they're doing that. So yeah, let us, let us know if you're happy to share that. Tammy said, how do you get consistent with OA slash RAs? Goods may not be repeatedly available um, or on offer. Yeah, so Tammy, just want to, I'll, I'll chip in first there just quickly. I'm not going to go into this in, in detail. Um, and I'll pass over to the other two if they want to add anything. So I think what you're talking about there is really the ability to be able to buy the same product again and again. And this is the answer I, I give, which is pretty bog standard uh, because I like to just use data because it's sort of evidence. In our business, we track the our total well, our spend each week and we put, we track like different areas. So for example, one of my VAs might source 10% of the products each week. Another might source 15% of the products. We might get 5% from like a deal pool that we're in. But 60 around 65% of our products each week that we source are based on spend. So if we spend 10 grand in a week, about six and a half grand will be on replenishable items. And we don't particularly, um, we don't particularly like target uh, items that are um, what we think are gonna be replenishable. So we don't look for items that we think, yeah, we're gonna be able to buy this again and again and again. What we do is we buy anything that's worthwhile. So I can't always say that, well, the risk and reward and the, um time and reward if those things are met which is very broad uh, but that could take hours to go into that there if those criteria are met then we buy the item but then we have a system on the back end that allows us to spend six well 65 percent of our spend each week is on replenishable items now again i could talk about that for hours but really that replenishable system is something that i do teach and i'm happy again to go into a bit more detail to that on the strategy call for anyone who does want to jump on that in essence we basically just have a system to monitor um, all the items that are selling and we then factor in sort of um we don't just check the item see if we can buy it again which a lot of people do but we actually then manage it like if it's out of stock we have a system whereby we're checking it um if the price has changed we have a system where we're getting notified we try and have stock alerts using sites that are for scraping and these different different tools and um, systems there to hit that kpi so that's a high level overview because as i hope you can appreciate like that's something that takes hours to go over the whole system but if you do want a bit more detail on that then you can jump into a strategy call there um that's my thoughts i will say again that there's no one correct way gavin i would guess has probably got a lower um spend in terms of proportionally for replenishable items so probably not 65 percent because his strategy is different and some people might have higher like Eamon's maybe higher because of the wholesale perhaps he can buy those items more frequently i don't know but what i would say is no correct amount but having that system in place where you can sort of check and buy those items again because replenishables are so powerful you have that history there you're not guessing based on keeper keeper might suggest it's selling five per month when actually you're selling 20 or 30 and yeah you're not guessing if the items are the same you got all that you basically you're looking at sort of data of other people and limited data versus what's actually happening so replenishables are very powerful i'd say but i'll finish up there and i'll pass over to do either of you to have anything to add on there i would just say about the the keeper data and stuff like that is that I recently spoke to Nor I Al Kjartan about this um, at an issue where two items had sold at about four or five pounds over the buy box and it was completely out of character that they'd sold and I went and went through it all and it wasn't showing up anywhere and I messaged him and he was just like, No, somebody has been in and specifically selected you as a seller to purchase your items. And I went and looked through it and I've seen multiple occasions where I've sold maybe 30, 40 items myself in a month whereby the sales data is all suggests it's only maybe selling 20. And again, that takes time to build up. And that is where the limitations of autom automation and software will let you down. And it just comes from experience where if you can go in and run a business report on Amazon and you can see that you're selling out 30 units of stock in three weeks, well, then you need to take on 40 or 50 units in a month. And again, it takes time to scale it up. Um, give a brand new seller all the information in the world and a million quid, they still will struggle to get the money spent and do everything. So it just takes time, it takes experience, it takes a little bit of guidance and support. 
So it's never just going to be one quick fix answer. Exactly. Yeah. Any other thoughts there, Gavin? Not much to add to that, to be honest. Cool. Yeah. Good stuff. All right. Well, I'm just trying to look where we're at. I think we're up to the dog names and didn't get many with lots of reactions. So I think um, sort of safe for, for now. Um, if you missed it, sort of had the puppy on display for a bit. Uh, I do like Chris's idea. He said to name the <laughs> puppy naked so that you can say I'm going to walk naked in the park. Do do enjoy that. Um, yeah, it's pretty funny. Um, unfortunately, I think the novelty might wear off. Anyway, Aaron mentioned that he has some stock in Amazon that's been sat in the warehouse for a few months, but there are other sellers much lower prices than him. Is it worth leaving it in Amazon and paying storage fees for a few months while the sellers drop off or request to send it back to me and then resend it to Amazon and the sellers drop off? Also, that's very cute puppy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so look, I, I wouldn't ever, me personally, I would never create a removal order to then send something back in just because it's not going to be worth the hassle for me now. You might have systems in place to manage that. You might have stock management systems, but I don't drip feed. I, I drip feed next to no stock. But if you've got some big bulky items that are a lot of eating up a lot of storage fees, you might want to pull them out and send them back in. The thing is, the thing is, Aaron, it's like these kind of questions are really, it depends because there's no right or wrong answer. A lot of the stuff that whenever you're doing manual intervention like this, whenever you have to go in and make judgment calls that are, on black and white you're taking up your time your energy or one of your staff's time and energy and you just got to consider like are you getting a reward on that time so this is kind of something that would probably fall into a repricing element and with us we have a repricing system where we try and automate a lot of it but we have like manual interventions um for example if we flag an item at the time of purchase as like a volatile item which we might might tank and then go up in price we want to kind of make sure that we're not sort of selling it at the bottom of the price when we know if we wait a couple of weeks, we're going to be able to sell it at a higher price. You might also have items that have expiry dates and we have a system whereby we then check it to make sure it's sold well before the expiry date. So there's all these different things where we will have automatic rules that will adjust our minimum price and a repricing rule based on different triggers. And a lot of that's automated, but we also have those manual interventions. And again, um, a lot of this comes into, well, there's a lot there. Uh, and what I mean by that is it would take a lot of time for me to talk through all these things. But at a high level, that's what I'd do. And what I would say is to try not get bogged down by this. Now, if you've got 100 units and you're paying two pounds in storage fees for each unit per month, okay, that's going to be worth your time. But if you've got four units and it's two pence storage fee per month, you know, you, I, I doubt that's the case because then if you print a removal, it's going to be more than that. So really just consider like where you're spending your time like what are your priorities what are the things that are going to make a big impact for you making a decision over something that's maybe five or ten quid um as a one-off probably isn't worth the mental hassle try and get that repricing system to sort of automate and systemize as much as you can if you've got a team get into help with manual interventions or at least if you're going to do this like have manual reviews do it systematically like once a week at specific times you can kind of do it make a decision get on with life there but really try and weigh up what is the cost of your time and what are you kind of getting out of, of that? Because it's not just the money or the time, but it's the mental energy as well. Every decision you make, you're going to start to build up the mental fatigue there. So that's my thoughts at a pretty high level. Um, I'll pass on to the other guys now to see if they've got anything to add there. So I would look at the opportunity cost. How much capital do you have? How much capital is this taking up? So at the, at the end of the day, your job is to scale this business and if this stock is just sitting there then that's costing you money because you're not making money from it so my, my sort of question would be why is it being there for seven months in the first place like but don't get me wrong if you couldn't spend all that capital anyway then i understand that because i bought some stuff in march for summer which i would never do that if i was if i was still growing like quickly because your, your cash your cash turnover cycle it's so important to grow as quick as you possibly can so it's kind of like how much capital do you have how long is it going to take to clear that capital and could you spend this capital on making more money if you got that back because sometimes you might have to nuke the price 
you might have to go back a few steps in terms of price but you'll get that money back and more from your next products so you need you need to look at your cost your the opportunity cost there Yeah, exactly. I think that's massive. That, that's something I missed there in terms of the opportunity uh, costs. So if you've got limited capital, so capital, that's an awesome tip there. And that's the thing Like we'd rather just clear out stock, get that cash and, and recycle it in, in a lot of instances. But yeah, there's, there's a lot of, I think repricing is an element where people definitely don't spend enough time, at least in sort of the right way. A lot of people just kind of go in and check their prices all the time and move things around. And I think if you did like Gavin said and review where you're spending your time each week, um you might you might find it interesting there so yeah i highly recommend doing time review um every so often where you basically just know where you're spending your time each week and review that all right um joseph asked how do you guys keep on top of your replenishables and consistently restocking your inventory so i mean yeah this this is kind of leading on from that oara consistency and i i mentioned there we sort of got that replenishable system which we have so we have a lot of systems in place there and i think look it's again it's difficult for me to explain so in the training program we have the amazon arbitrage blueprint there's a whole module dedicated purely just to replenishables so i'm not really going to go into any more detail than we've already covered there joseph but again if you are interested in learning a bit more detail there happy to jump on that on a strategy call with you there if you do want more um, detail but hopefully that high level will give you some things to think about there um, but yeah, if you've got a system in place and get a VA to manage that, that's probably the best way to go about it. Um, a quick tip on that, yeah, though, that, is that for also for replenishables, like you may have not even sourced a product, but you can still consider it replenishable. Let's, let's say in Lego, for example, if you spot an item on Amazon that's selling at a bit of a premium, the Lego hasn't been retired yet. You can go on Lego and look at that product and then sign up to the alerts. So when Lego restock that item, you then get emailed. Yeah, that's an awesome one. There's lots of different, yeah, there's, there's out of stock tips and there's a site, um, Visual Ping and similar ones where you can basically scrape the site and if there's a change in that, that site, it will notify you. So you could look at where it says like email or well, out of stock. Uh, this would be for when you don't you can't get an email when it's back in stock you can look at it where it says out of stock highlight that area if that changes then you get an alert and you can go in and check that lots of different tips and tricks there and building out systems for it again you can go and build all that stuff by yourself but i'm happy to you to leverage that knowledge from what i've already done there in the, the program we have um elaine i know Eamon, you've already mentioned something on this elaine says do you think the big players uh are ruthless in their tactics and trying to keep the buy box and make it difficult for smaller sellers to be able to win the buy box and i think as you said there Raymond, it really just depends uh i'm not going to add much more to that i think it really just depends on the seller uh there yeah it really does there's no there's no rhyme or reason to it and it's it even goes yes and person like there's a couple of sellers that i know that are sourcing from the same wholesaler as myself and some items they will just go down to the bare bones where I know they're selling at a break even to get the buy box all the time so just rotate and I think like I said the comment that comes down to their priorities and their stock levels and what they're wanting and there is no compensation for human nature it's somebody else in the end of the computer making a decision and there's no real way to mitigate that only sort of deal with their actions I mean I'm not a big singer or anything, but I know that if people keep undercutting me all the time, sometimes I'll, if they're a small account, I'll destroy the price. And I do that because they're going to look at who's done that. And if they see that every, every one of the listings that we're on, I'm destroying the price because they keep undercutting me. Then in the future, if they see my name on that listing, they'll think twice about selling it. So there, there's, I think there's some sort of implied value there. Some sort of <laughs> You bully. I'm like, Such well, a just, flex. <laughs> just don't undercut me. I love it. Oh, I'll just show the price. Yeah. yeah. I uh, oh. I usually WhatsApp them and tell them to put their price up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's one way to do it. I think there's a good <laughs> example recently. This guy had 50 units and he kept undercutting me. I'm pretty sure I got them at the cheapest, mm. but I, I nuked the price by 30 to 40%. And he, he didn't put a min on his repricer. 
So he was selling all of his units at such a low price. Once his units got to like five left, I flipped mine back up again. Yeah, there's lots of different things you can do, but um, yeah, I think it really depends. But look, I'm I'm conscious of the time, and I still want to jump back to yourself, Gavin, to yeah, to sort of go in a bit more detail what you do. So I'm going to whisk through sort of comments. Um, Ash gave some sort of advice, so I'm just going to pop that up on the stream there. I've just kind of remember that I can do that, so I'll pull that up. Uh, I think that works. We're going to see. There's a bit of a delay but that should come up. Hey, Calvo, how you doing? Yeah, cool. That does come up. Um, cool. Calvo, yeah, in terms of a recap, this will be available on a replay afterwards. So um, you can watch that and skim sort of through. But I have replied with a comment there. Um, OK, it looks like. Uh, Thomas says, got to go. No worries, dude. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Mr. Parkinson, that is. Uh, Aaron says, thank you for clearing that up for me. I'll try to tank my price and cut my losses to gain the capital back and reinvest. Yeah, no worries, Aaron. I think I think a lot of the time it, it does depend. There's no right or wrong answer. But again, it comes back to almost like the sort of probabilities, the expected return there. Just to add to that, don't have emotional weight to your listings. If you have emotional weight to your listings, you're going to lose money. Like, apply whether to get in or whether to get out with just logic, and not don't don't make it an a emotional investment. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Awesome. Um, um, sorry, go on, Evan. Yeah, I was just going to say most of the items I sell, I have absolutely no care or consideration for. <laughs> I love the process, not the actual items. The very few items that I'm passionate about. <coughs> My voice. Yeah, you're right there. It yeah, sound, it sounds like you're getting quite emotional. Sounds like you're getting quite emotional about the items to me. <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't care about whatever she needs. Nothing. <laughs> Most of them I buy myself. It's cost me a fortune, like, but I just can't, can't get rid of it. I just buy it. <laughs> All right. Um, Dan mentioned the tool there, um, SKU Grids, to notify stock price and change. I haven't heard of it, so I'll check that out. Thank you, Dan. And I know uh, Dan Adams, that is. Dan Miles said he's got 2,100 items being monitored with the Chrome extension. Works quite well, especially with limited Ryman stock. It sounds awesome there, Dan. If you're happy to share, that would be cool. Um, if not, no worries. That's the thing. You've got to get your little tips and tricks. Um, Elaine says you're ruthless. Uh, Calvis said you can add it at MF, crush the price, then sell out back to normal. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Calvin Calvin on the same wavelength there. Um, yeah, a few people want the name of that extension. As, Ash says, place fair pricing. When he has double figures of stock, like 16 other sellers, any one or two, let them sell out because I know he, he knows they will dominate buy once they all sell out. Yeah, it really depends. Look, I think it depends on your model as well. I'll just put a bit of context in. I have 500 active SKUs at the moment, roughly. So we're not going to be going and checking a lot of those. So a lot of it's automation where the more you kind of have in one item, the more of the manual intervention you want to have. So we won't do manual intervention if we've got like, say, 20 quid worth of stock. But if we've got two grand worth mm -hmm. of stock, definitely going to be having some sort of manual intervention mixed in there. Or I'd say manual intervention is just kind of someone checking the listing to see if we want to override any of the automatic repricing. Uh, Kelsey says he's going to catch up. No worries, dude. Um, and thanks. It's glad to see him home. I hope to see you soon again. Yeah, definitely, man. I think with the COVID restrictions lifting, definitely going to be planning on some sort of meetups uh, group-wide and just small groups as well. Um, I know a few people in Northern Ireland managed to do something back in September, which is pretty cool. But all right. We are now caught up. So, yeah, I just wanted to, I think, just a bit generally there gavin um maybe just talk a bit more about like why do you think you've had the success that you've had and maybe if there's kind of any takeaways you'd give to people who are listening to this i, I think one of the key reasons for my success i mean effort is obviously there but i never i never really had any what you call self-limiting beliefs about what's possible with amazon like, I know that most UK sellers do it differently, but I never believed, 
I always believe that you don't have to do it that way, and there is other ways. Whereas if I spend all my time looking for lower ROI items and lower priced, because my time is so limited, I definitely wouldn't have scaled and grew this quick. But because I just kept kept at it, kept trying, I was able to figure out ways that worked for me. Like you can get very creative on Amazon. Like you can make lists of competitors, you can search for stores. There's a, there's a lot you can do. So yeah, definitely not having self-limiting beliefs about how much time uh, it takes or what works, what doesn't work. It's all about figuring it out yourself and what works for you. But and then wait, once you find something that works, really you've only you've only actually found the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to that strategy that you can learn, and that's what took me to the next level. Is well, once I find something that works, once I find a product product that worked, I checked all the category. I then checked all of EU sales. I checked Amazon, Italy, France, Spain for their stock levels. Then I checked America as well. So there's always more that you can do. And I think I think it's just taking that taking it that extra level further. Another another example is that I was talking to a lot of distributors and wholesalers for some of my hot products, but not to source of products. I was using them as a exit strategy because once they could stock, okay, I need to get out now because now stock's coming into the market. So it's it's about playing the game in a way that fits you and not how it's been dictated to you from other other people's self-limiting beliefs because what might not work for them could work for you and what works for you might not work for me we're all different right yeah, yeah i think that's um, exactly it it's sorry i'm doing it sorry there. no no i'll go i think i was just going to say like it, it really is it's almost i think i think the thing is it's it's interesting because I said this when I was in the live and I don't know, I can't remember when I was saying it, but you build up sort of authority when you kind of achieve the results. It's you can always say different things or whatever, but when you kind of got that proof of concept with like Gavin has, I mean, to achieve what he has is kind of incredible. That's sort of 60 K profit in an eight month window while sort of working full time up until sort of two, three weeks ago, but then to be able to quit that full time job and do this full time and to now have five team members it's kind of insane um and i think interestingly for me when i was looking at your graph the one thing that stood out was that february was your best month and i think that kind of shows is that like the fact that q4 wasn't your sort of like highest sales point and the fact that it was february to me just kind of shows the the trajectory that you're on and now going into the us as well it's kind of insane and so going back to my point where i said look like you can go in learn these things yourself try uh, and sort of test but when you can leverage the experience of other people always go down that route and i mean everyone who's on this live right now is doing that to some extent because you're taking that information and whether you use it or not is up to you um come with a crow but take what is relevant to you and discard the rest and make it your own blah 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 you know hopefully what i'm talking about pick out the bits that are relevant to you and even if there's just one takeaway you can get from this live like utilize that so and as gavin said like try and do those things that are maybe a bit different uh, and go with those and um, yeah to add to that the good thing is that once you do find something different and if it is a trend a trend ignores all normal market conditions to an extent depending on how, how intense the demand is for that that that's why that's why my february was the most insane because Q4 didn't affect my sales at all because I was still building capital. The demand, the, the demand in Q4 was the same as it was in February, because the demand is just the demand. Whereas for for a lot of other sales, may have slowed slowed down in February because it does slow down for a lot of people for normal items. But because I'm selling high demand items, nothing changes really. Yeah, it's cool. Uh, that's fair enough. Interesting. And I think it is like it's it's funny because you almost have like me and you have very different um, sort of ways of sourcing, I think. And uh, it'll be interesting to see how you do sort of shift over time. So I know you mentioned um, sort of your plans sort of with the, the US going into sort of next year when we had a chat early on today, which was very interesting. I don't know, Eamon, if you had anything you wanted to, to add there. Yeah, I think. I think trends are, are brilliant. Like, yes, Easter, Easter eggs, you know, toys at Christmas. But there's a lot of other 
ongoing trends that you don't realize. Like, I got sent a message last night at 11 o'clock for an item that's ranked very high in health and beauty. I mean, like, in the top 50. And I was given the link to the supplier website. It was a friend of mine, like, hey, my daughter was just looking, seen this on TikTok and said, why are you not selling that on Amazon? And I was like, right, I'm getting sourcing tips from a 13-year-old wee girl 10 miles down the road who's sitting watching videos on TikTok. And she's like, yeah, all our influencers are talking about this. It's selling really well. I'm like, great. So it's just paying attention to the market. I'm not saying go out and read the paper and stuff like that there, but it's paying attention to what's going on locally and nationally of what's going to be popular. You know, summertime yeah. sells summer items. It's it sounds logical, but a lot of people overlook it because, you know, it didn't come up in their their VA didn't find it because maybe it's not coming up in the common websites. But if you go to obscure websites and you're looking for specific items, you can find absolute gold mines. Absolutely. And don't don't just avoid items because Amazon's selling it. Like yeah. if Amazon have a history of going out of stock in the item and then it goes up to a premium, you, you can sneak in there and just sell it at an absolute premium. Like don't don't just get bogged down that Amazon's selling it, you'll never be able to sell it the item. Look look at the keeper and see because the, the keeper graph is a story. Look at what the story tells you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Oh. <clears throat> that's right. an interesting and question. Um, yeah, I was going to say. Powell, apologies if I'm butchering your name there, and um, asking if both myself and Gavin use the prep center. Um, I don't because I'm very fortunate in the facilities that I have provided to me. Um, Gavin, I'm going to assume you don't use a prep center based on quick turnaround time you're talking about in fact you said you might have felt some lens i actually do use a prep center but i, I was yeah. doing 50 50 between fba and fbm but i do try and i do try and fba everything because prepping myself destroys my soul i hate it so much <laughs> it's so boring man oh my god but uh, I, I i do i do what i do where the money flows like if if i get more money of fbm in certain items then i'll fbm them so I'll do what gets me the most money, basically. But there is the time analysis of that. It has to be like a lot of money for it to be worth it. Not like two pound or five pound per item. If I'm getting like 40 quid to 100 quid per item, I'll FB in it. Can't deliver it for that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I have a couple items and they just work better merchant and they're they're easily prepped. They're literally into a poly bag and out the door. But I have other items that I've bought because they sold better FBM because of the weight. Yeah. And I can't wait to get see it shot of them. I'm very tempted to sell them at a loss or break even just to get them out of my sight. I'm sick looking at them. And I'm just like, I don't care about the money in you anymore. I can't face looking at you another day. <laughs> just go away. These That's items that I've, I've very tempted to put the gallon of pet on to as well. So, you know, <laughs> wow, That's they amazing. were free. So, <laughs> maybe you I can think... do that on the on the live stream. Be an uh, interesting one. Ooh. I might. <laughs> yeah, that would be uh, interesting. I think in general that you have to be dynamic with your decisions to whatever works best at that time. Because you can't FBA items if it's taking five weeks to get checked in. It makes no sense. So you, you have to put it dynamic. And, but then it's also circumstantial because Luke wouldn't be able to just start FBM in easily, I'd imagine. Yeah, I think it, it, this is the thing. It's, it goes back to there's never, there's no right and wrong yeah. answer in general. Like it's it really depends on people's circumstance. Like, always ask yourself the question, like, what do you want from the business? And then well, what suits you? Because realistically, okay, yes, this can be a stepping stone, but kind of consider the fact that you probably got a long time left to live um, in general. So how is this helping you get to where you want to be? So I always, as I've said to a few times recently, so I asked the question, I will, do I want to be doing this thing in a few years time? If the answer is yes, cool, carry on doing it. If not, why am I doing it? And it's not the fact that, okay, you just start ruling out everything, but it's like, well, that could be building up capital to do another thing. So like prep, for example, if you're low, it could be you sourcing to then 
bringing a sourcing VA and get them to do it, purchasing to get someone else to do, you know, like there's that kind of thing. But at the same time, if you're doing prep and you hate in your life doing it and you don't have any intentions of hiring people and scaling that, then kind of why are you, you doing it? You know, asking that question uh, is what I have to say. So, yeah. Um, yeah, as Calvo said, I could pay prep sense to FBM, so I feel prime. I, I try not to complicate things too much. Again, it's opportunity cost. Where am I spending my time? To be honest, I've just got more lucrative things to put it into. So it really does depend uh, there. Um, there is one more question, and I kind of want to jump back to sort of Gavin. So I did mention to talk about where people can get yeah. some more info. So we'll come back to this question, Paul. Um, and any other questions, if you don't have any questions, drop them in, then we'll come back to them. But now I just wanted to kind of earlier on in the stream. So if you just jumped in, sort of said, we're going to chat a bit about what to the Gavin does. And hopefully you've gotten some value from that session. Hopefully a few tips and challenge challenged your mindset. I think that's the key thing and some sort of takeaway. Now there is an option for people who do want some more information um so again like gavin has generated 60k profit in the past sort of eight months with, with a full-time job up to the past couple of weeks so if you sort of take that experience the ability to do that and now we're sort of saying gavin i've chatted to him to be able to bring this opportunity to anyone who does want this um gavin's offering four group calls capped at five people each because look this is his strategy realistically don't want everyone knowing his secrets there so yeah if you don't if you're not interested in this no problem not my intention to sort of just make these lives about selling things but if you do want some more information and you want to jump on a one hour ish i don't know exactly how long it'll be gavin can maybe share some more details in a minute a session with gavin for him to deep dive into his sourcing strategies um share what he's done over the past sort of eight months to generate that 60k profit you're going to have that opportunity and wanted to make this super accessible uh, to deliver a lot of value so it's only 19 pounds for that one session there i will drop the link to this um it is capped at 20 slots so that's four times five and they're all going to be live sessions with gavin so for me it's pretty much a no-brainer at 19 pounds but it's really up to you um if you want to jump in go ahead you've got the link there it's also in the description so if you're watching us on a replay you can check the description um or you can come back to it now i do want to pass over to gavin gavin do you want to just share a little bit more about what kind of things you're going to cover on that session and if anyone does have any questions about this drop them in the the comments there but yeah over to yourself Gavin. yeah so we've been looking at amazon to amazon flips mostly so we've been looking at best selling, best selling items of amazon so sort of what are trending items how we spot seasonal items and then looking at keeper so we'll, we'll go through the keeper graphs we'll understand where we can buy how we can leverage amazon today's deal to create keeper trackers and then reverse search to buy them at a cheaper price to send back to Amazon and also making list of competitors, how, how we categorize different sellers and how we watch different sellers. And then we also steal their products. So that's, that, that's sort of the gist of it. I think that's, yeah, I think it's quite a bit different to what you probably normally used to sourcing. But this can definitely open up like a whole new world of sourcing to you. This is how I do a lot of my sourcing and where a lot of my items come from. I think that's I think that's the thing. Like, look, it's I talk about that leveraging the experience of other people. I mean, if, if you're serious about your business, then what what's 19 pounds to you? Realistically, it's not the 19 pounds, it's the one hour of your time. Um, I think everyone who's watching this live needs to kind of value their time. And if you're not kind of valuing at least 19 pounds per hour when you're sort of looking at those tasks, I would seriously advise you to consider to do that because it's going to change the way you look at your business. And with that being said, um, look, I'm saying 19 pounds is, is okay. I'm not naive in saying that's nothing to a lot of people, but I'm saying in the context of your business, it's going to be a very small investment. And I'm saying that because, look, if you jump onto this session, as you'll see on that page, 
And if you're not 100% satisfied with the session, we'll not just refund you the 19 pounds, but also send you 19 pounds to compensate you for your time. So basically, if you're not 100% happy with that, for whatever reason, you'll get um, your 19 pounds back and another 19 pounds there. So that's just to ensure that you're gonna get that value if you're on the fence and you're a bit concerned with it. But yeah, as I sort of mentioned, I think at the end of the day, the results speak for themselves. This isn't someone who's on a webinar um, with a name beginning with M who never sells on Amazon, pitching your course on how to sell on Amazon. Um, I'll let you use your imagination on that one. <laughs> she still <laughs> results so yeah um i have sent the link there elaine if apologies i'll send it again in case it's been missed there but cool um yeah look there's there's a few questions so i'll jump back to to them but i don't know gavin or amy did you have anything else you wanted to add there before we go back so i know pal had a couple of questions there um yeah i'd argue that you know I know a hell of a lot, but I'm still massively impressed with Gavin's results and I'm booking one of the calls simply because <laughs> it's 20 quid. I'll spend more than that tomorrow on my lunch. And I just think, yeah, for 20 quid in an hour of my time, if that can get me one item that I make 50 quid profit on, it's still worth it. I will so, say one thing, guys. It's easier to find items if you already know it's selling. If you find items that are already selling, then if you just reverse search that, then you already know what you're selling. So the most difficult part is already done for you. Yeah. Pretty much, yeah. I think that's that's kind of the key of the models looking at that data there. And it's, I think, Gavin, as you mentioned, it's with those people that are already selling. Um, look, I think the one thing I will say, just lastly, is, yeah, this is capped at the 20 slots. And if I'm looking now, I've just refreshed and I can see that five have already gone in total. So, I mean, that's five within a few minutes of mentioning that. So if you do want to get on this, um, I would jump in. As I sort of mentioned there, there is that double money back guarantee and uh, no questions asked. So yeah, if you're not interested, no worries. Just if you're on the fence, I would jump in because we are capping this at those 20 spots as mentioned, because Gavin is sharing a lot of his stuff there. Now, jumping back to the questions to sort of wrap up um because look i, I have to be honest i'm pretty tired the puppy seems to not like me sleeping so much so he's fast asleep and that means he's going to keep me awake later which is great but anyway um pal said what are your most heavy fb items and i think he's linking this to prep is killing him but items are 70 percent grocery where prep fees will kill profit but he's looking to source products with more I think he's saying products with more profit there. Um, it'll be quite tricky to do 50-50. Now, my thoughts here are, yeah, look, if you've got an item, if it's 50p to prep an item and you've got an item with a selling price of £10 versus if you've got an item with a selling price of £50, you're still paying 50p, right? 50p as a percentage of £10, 5%, but as a percentage of um, £50, was it one percent yeah one percent i think my as i said very tired at one percent so that, that's kind of the thing there and i think this is what i'd say is almost um a lot of people know luke dugan so i'm going to use him as an example did a lot of um low cost high roi fast selling items and then those prep fees really affected that uh, i believe i haven't spoken to luke much so maybe he can correct me if he's if he's listening in and with me though i generally don't sell as many high um, high velocity, low profit, low ROI type items. So my prep fees are a smaller percentage of that. So as you're saying, Powell, there, it's like, if you're selling lots of grocery items there, that's gonna have an impact because, well, I say grocery, but I'm saying like low selling prices away because it's a higher percentage. The prep fees are a higher percentage of the selling price for lower priced items. So that is gonna have an impact. Um, that's got to be a consideration there with the sort of prep fees so yeah I, I mean hopefully that helps that kind of context and maybe if you do sort of shift your strategy a little bit to look at other areas maybe that's going to help but i think the one thing i would say is if you're if you're buying bulk lots of small items you should be able to negotiate better rates with your prep center because for them to bang out 200 of the same item um 
not going to take them very long. And if they're charging you the same as someone who's bundling shampoos together and sending three bundles in, it's, yeah, you know. Um, and this is why I kind of say, like, you don't have to go all prep center or all prep yourself. You could do a bit of a hybrid. And prep centers probably won't like me for saying this. Sounds like one of those ads. Doctors hate her for secret trick. You know? <laughs> prep centers probably won't like me for saying this, but you could do a bit of a hybrid. Like if you have a couple hundred items that are going to be very easy for you to prep, you could send that to yourself. More annoying items, or yeah, you could send off to the prep center there. So yeah, that's that's all I'll, I'll add there. I don't know if either yourself there, Gavin, or yourself, anyone, have got anything to add there. Yeah, well, <clears throat> these are a lot of items that I bundle, and there are times where it gets frustrating. I've invested a lot of money in machinery to help me with that. Um, shrink up machine, my father turned around to me and said, yes, he was like, many poly bags would you have to buy before you recoup the cost of this machine? And I was like, probably a ton of them. But yeah, um, for, for some items that I would definitely give consideration to just banging out the door to a prep center if they could do them just for some, the volume of time it takes me to do them. There's some items I can do 200 of them in half an hour. There's other items it takes me an hour to do 20. So it's your cost of time, your cost of opportunity. It's do you want to be still doing this in five years' time? If not, why are you doing it tomorrow? I mean, I'm not pulling back in anything. I'd rather just set that on fire. That's too soul destroying. <laughs> I, 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 have, I have like a what a one meter by half meter items in my room that I send off. So my items that I send off manually are quite big. Like these tiny items, man, I just can't handle that. It drives me insane. It's so long. I got a new one today. Like, I do all my own prep. I'm aware of all the prep requirements. I got hit with a new one today. Must be opaque bagged. Had to be sent in in black bags. I'm like, I don't have black bags. You can't get black shrink wrap. Um, so I sent it in as is, and I'm waiting for Amazon to hit me up with a 15p prep fee for each one. We'll see if it comes or not, but I've never had that before. Four years, first time got that. Had yeah, to be sent in a black bag. It's just so wrong, man. Just the, the entire sending it out yourself for small items is just so wrong. Like, if I sell one £300 item and you sell, like, a £10 item, you have to send 30 of them out to match my £300 item. Yep. That's so much hassle, man. Imagine if you saw it in a bear. Oh my god, no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah, I but some of the I'm gonna have a debate on this all night. <laughs> no, no, it's 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 not a debate because what he says is completely valid and correct. Yeah. It's just I can make money on the items that I sell as well. Yeah. There's some items I sell, I make sell fifty a day and I make maybe seventy five quid every day on them. And mm -hmm. that's why I've just signed up for your course because I know what's lacking in my business at the minute is the high value items because the low value items in volume i pretty much got it down at the minute but i want to balance that out the high ticket items i've got yeah. the money sitting there i've got the space and facilities i just want a little bit more knowledge on it and that is why i was one of the first ones to pick your call because i can completely see the value of it um yeah you're right i wish like i i piled up 544 items in one go this evening if they were all 300 quid items with 50, 60 quid profit in each one of them, I'd be minted. <laughs> yeah. <I> think that... <laughs> what color did your Ferrari be? <laughs> I can't even remember the last time I prepped an item and I'm quite happy with that. <laughs> yeah, but I don't have a dog barking at me all night, so. Yeah, I mean, they're both conscious choices. I, I think I'd rather pick the dog <laughs> than the, the prep, although at least, as you said, the yeah. prep doesn't bark, bark at you when you're trying to sleep, yeah. so, yeah. It know. does still cost me sleep, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I have noticed that with some of the hours that you decide to work, but anyway. Dog is <laughs> in the background. There we go. Well, these, if you can hear that, it's probably going to wake up puppies. So, probably a good time to, I think, wrap it up there. I don't think I can see any more questions. So, last chance to sort of ping a question if you do have. As I sort of said in the message there, congratulations to everyone who has booked. It's 
kind of crazy. There's now actually only six spots left. So we've already filled 14 out of 20 spots. So yeah, if you want to jump in, six spots left, uh, and then it's full capacity there. So besides from that, look, thanks everyone for joining. I hope you found it fun, entertaining, uh, interesting, all of the above, one of them. If not, well, why have you watched for one and a half hours? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so good stuff all. And yeah, sounds like quite a lot of you are going to be seeing a bit more of Gavin's face um, pretty pretty soon. So <laughs> I think that's I think that's I think that's the real true. reason, really. People don't care about the, the training. It's not about any of that. They just want some more of Gavin, really. But cool. Come awesome. get me. All right. Good. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. Don't see any more questions there. So just from me to kind of say thanks to everyone. Um, thanks to Eamon again for joining me. Thanks for Gavin for giving up his time to jump on live for this. It's been really interesting. As Gavin mentioned there, we had a chat, I think, back in, I don't know, probably about September time, I think, September, October. Oh, no, it would have been earlier than that. It would have been about August, I think. Had a yeah, call a with Gavin, Gavin there back in August. So to be able to kind of see his journey uh, as it progresses is is awesome. So that's great. Um, I mean, guys, I can still remember the call. So yeah, it's got to be pretty good. But that's a long <laughs> time ago to remember and reference back to. So yeah, definitely recommend it. Yeah, if anyone does want to jump on that, the free strategy call, um, I'll drop another link in there that again, just to kind of quickly recap, everything is on the page, but the idea there is we're covering basically any questions that you have um, and it's tailored to you. So if you're just starting out or if you are months down the line, it's kind of personalized to put, basically put together a plan for you, break down the finances, why you're doing what you're doing. And then from there, tailor a plan for you. Now you then got three options. You can either go and implement that plan by yourself. You can decide that why the hell am I doing online arbitrage and actually stop. Or the third option is you can jump into the uh, training program with us and we'll help you implement that plan. So yeah, no obligation there. That's up to you. Um, but yeah, you've got a couple options there. And again, thank you everyone. Have a good night or wherever you are in the world, morning, evening, if you're watching the replay, whatever, I don't know, have a good one. And I will see you same time next week, 7 p.m. UK every Wednesday. Cheers all. See you guys. Thanks, everybody. Take it easy. Bye now.